Come on down, answers. for your love and your mercy, for your long suffering, dear God, and for this opportunity to be in your house today, for the good night's rest, and for all the smiling faces that I see here today, we are thankful. Father, I pray for this service today that you just break our hearts. Let us see our need of you in our lives today. Lord, I know that you give Pastor Mel exactly what we need here today, and we love you and appreciate you, and, and, and so thankful that you are our Savior now, God, move as only as you can through the music and through the, through the message here today. And may we leave this place feeling a whole lot different than we did when we got here. And we'll praise you, for it's in your precious name. And amen. You may be seated at this time. Choir, are you ready to sing? Amen. All right, let's do one of my old favorites. Ready? All right, girls.
your feet and love one another as we prepare to worship him. Wasn't that a good one? Amen. Love each other today.
serving the king of the world, guys. Let's sing it from our hearts. I tried to fit you in the walls inside my mind. I tried to keep you safely in between the lines. I tried to put you in the box that I
we're at, whatever situation we're in, whatever circumstances we're facing, it's not an empty place. It's a place of purpose. It's a place of design. We all like to have a smooth path, sunny days, but that isn't what life is about. Help us learn today your purpose in our life as we go through some difficult times. And help us, Lord, to learn and see your love in it. And give us your strength and wisdom to endure and to become more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. We pray in his name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Our folks or little ones or junior church can be dismissed. Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews chapter 12. I want to remind you of a couple of things real quick. Starting next Monday, this uh, uh, River Valley Gospel Crusade will be out at the uh, school board, um, the Old Moose Club, and uh, I hope you'll get some of those and invite some folks to pray for that, that God will bless it and use it to reach people for Jesus. We want that to happen. How many here grew up in a home where your parents believed in corporal punishment? Oh, my. I thought that had gone out of fashion. Um, where they applied the Board of Education to the seat of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately this morning, in many cases, and probably right here in our own community, that has gone out of fashion for sure. Now, if a, a youngster uh, gets out of hand, we give him a time out. We send them to the room so they can watch TV, play on their computer, or talk on their cell phone. That sounds like a real problem to me, doesn't it, you? Um, my parents used to laugh about my brother and I. She said, Mel, they're talking about me, he said, Mel, wouldn't mind going to his room, he'd just get a book and read. But my brother hated it. Oh, he hated it. And I don't know how you felt, but folks, sometimes I wondered about my parents' discipline. It was painful, and I think it was supposed to be. And sometimes I think, wow. And I didn't understand it till I had children of my own and tried to discipline them. And it was hard sometimes. It was hard to do it with the right spirit. It was hard to do it in the right way. In Hebrews chapter 12, we have been working our way down through the latter part of chapter 11 and into chapter 12, uh, and last week we talked about running a race. Paul loved to use pictures of things that people understood so that they could help them to better understand the spiritual life. Last week he talked about running our race and how we're supposed to do that. Today he uses a different image, and he moves from the picture of athletics to the family. And he talks about the issue of discipline. I titled the message, God's Woodshed. Now, a lot of people don't know what a woodshed is anymore, but that used to be the place where to go, right? And uh, you got your switch out, and, and, uh, and, and, and that made you dance. And it didn't matter if you were Baptist or not, you danced. So, and my grandma, boy, I mean, she was a master at that thing. Because she just didn't let you wear your your jeans, you had to drop your jeans and just bare them legs and oh my goodness alive. And we don't have much of that anymore. 
People are afraid to. They're afraid to discipline that way in, in corporal punishment because somebody's going to turn them in or whatever. I started to ask how many have spanked their children, but it might be on tape and get on Facebook and y'all be arrested next week. So <laughs> I thought I better not do that. But the writer to the Hebrews says these folks are going through some very difficult times in their life, difficult circumstances. And he uses an interesting word. If you look with me at verse 4, he says, You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord. The word chasten is used nine times in eight verses. And it basically is the word that means child training. It is referring to the things that a parent would do to train their children in order to behave, to grow up, to be the best that they could be, to use all of their resources and abilities that God gave them and, and in various other sundry ways. A parent trains their children. He says, so in God's family, he does the same thing. He trains us, and he trains us through different types of discipline, and these are the things he's going to talk about today. He said, you have forgotten the exhortation, the, the scripture, he's saying, which speaketh unto you as unto children. God's children. These aren't little babies. These are adult children. He said, God's still working on you. We don't ever outgrow the need for discipline in our life. We need it all the way to the end. And he says, God has got something for us here this morning. He said, don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So when we think about this, he tells us a few things. He says, first of all, in verse 4, he says, listen, I want you to understand something. Don't give up. Don't give up and throw in the towel. So many times when things get hard because of the false teaching in our world today, people think that if things are hard, then, they're, then God's forgotten them or forsaken them. Folks, if things get tough, God hasn't forsaken you. He's still very much active. In fact, that's a good sign, and we'll see that in just a minute, although you don't think it's so pleasant. He said, just don't give up because other folks have gone through the same thing. And if you just look back, I don't know where you are in your page, but if you look back to chapter 11 in the passage that we read a few weeks ago, he says in verse 35, he said, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourging, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. He said, you guys aren't there yet. You're having it hard. It's a difficult situation you're in. You're having some difficult problems you're facing. But listen, you haven't spilled any blood yet. Standing against sin? I guess the question that everybody wants to know is why is it that God would do something like this? If God is a God of love, and he is, and if God loves you, and he does, then why would he allow these kinds of things to come into your experience as a believer? Why wouldn't he protect us from all that? Well, I think there are three reasons that I want to share with you just quickly this morning. The first reason, I believe, is for punishment. When I had to go to the woodshed, if you will, and the woodshed was Dad's room, and I'd been over the bed, and everything came after, you know, it was usually because I've done something. And even if I hadn't done something, I went ahead and did it. You know why? Because I knew that I did some stuff that he didn't catch, and so this is, well, get it, right? Yeah, that's right. Now, my brother, he was the opposite. Dad would say, bend over, son, and he'd say, Dad, let's talk a minute. Let me tell you something. And, you know, he'd talk him out of it. I don't know how he did that. He should have been a car salesman, I guess, or something. I don't know. I just do it. And it was usually because I did something wrong. And folks, guess what? If you do something wrong, God's going to discipline you. 
well, I don't like that. Well, <laughs> I didn't like it either. But God says, I'm going to discipline you. I'm going to take you to the woodshed. How do you know that? Well, let me just give you a perfect example. How about David? Do you think David was a godly man? Says he was. He was a man after God's own heart. But David was also a man that disobeyed God. And when he disobeyed God and he messed around with Bathsheba and had Uriah, her husband, killed and some other stuff, God says, I can't let him get away with that. And so he took that baby away. It died. One of his sons raped his daughter. Another son tried to overthrow him and run him out of town. David paid a price for that. But here's the difference that we need to understand this morning. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid the penalty for all of our sins. So when God disciplines you for your sin, he is not doing it in a punitive fashion. He's doing it for a corrective fashion. He's doing it to get you back on track. He's not doing it just to be mean or just to be un, 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 or unkind or, uh, or harsh. He's doing it because he wants you and me to be the best that we can be. And if something is in our life and standing in our way and we're not following God, he says, I'm going to come. I'm going to get you. Look down at verse number 6. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens. There's two things that we can learn about discipline in our life. Number one, it's God loves us. You, you ever had your parents tell you when you was about to get spanking, this hurts me worse than it hurts you? And I went, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, you don't have a big old belt across your bottom end until I had to discipline my children. They didn't believe it either, but Jill does now because she's got one that she's got to take care of. He says, listen to me, if God's chastening you folks, you better know this, he loves you. We always used like to sing, just as I am without one plea that, that thy blood was shed for me, O Lamb of God, I come. God loves you just as you are. He does love you just as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. When he gets you saved, he doesn't just mark you off the list like a gunslinger and put a notch in his gun and say, let me go find another one. When he comes to your life and into my heart and he saves us and gives us the assurance of eternal life and a home in heaven with him, that's the beginning. And he is in the process of developing us and maturing us, conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. When that image is marred and, and when it, something's missing there and, we're, and it's because of willful sin in our life, he says, I love you too much to leave you that way. And he's going to come and he's going to discipline us. And that discipline is for the purpose of bringing us back. It's getting us back on track. It's keep teaching us not to do that again. It's corrective because of our sin in our life. David said, I had to pay a high price, a high price for my sin, but I'm a better man because of it. The second thing and the reason I believe is because for prevention. Now in our world today, my wife and I, we went down yesterday, picked up Ellie, and we were talking on the way down. I don't know if you all have noticed it, maybe it's just me, but People are driving nuts these days. I'm telling you what. Had to go to the doctor Friday down in Proctorville, and people just pull out in front of you. And, I mean, don't even look, and it's almost like, I dare you to hit me. I need money, hit me. Things are dangerous. Our world is more dangerous. You and I, I hope, would not think about the fact of taking and putting our little children, these little babies that run around here, and putting them out in the yard to play by themselves without protection. We'd build a fence if we had to. We, we'd get someone, we'd sit out there with them, but we would protect our children. 
because they're babies and, and they don't understand that out in that street there's a car that'll hurt them. They don't understand that there's things in this world that can be injurious. They're just curious and, and they do things that they shouldn't do. And so we build a, a fence, if you will, around them to protect them. You wouldn't send them to the pool to swim and some of y'all have swimming pools. You just don't send them out and swim in the pool and don't go out there and watch. They need protecting. Well, guess what? So do you and me. We all need protecting. I'll give you an example. How about the Apostle Paul? As far as I'm concerned, he was a pretty good Christian. And not only was he a great Christian, but he was also a humble man. Whenever God used him to do something great and powerful and, and make a, a, a dent into that world and get the gospel to so many people, and people would say something to him, and Paul would say, it's all good to go. glory goes to God. All goes to God. So what did God do? Let me show you. Look over, if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Here's the man that was already humble, as far as we can tell. But in order to prevent him from being prideful, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7, it says, lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Notice this, the messenger of who? Somebody tell me. Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. What do you, you think that Satan came up with this plan? No. God used the plan. And he used Satan to do it. You see, God's still in charge, folks. Amen? He's still in charge. And Satan has to do what, he want, what God wants him to do. And he says, he sent this to me as a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above, above, above measure. Here's the humblest man that you could probably find. And God says, I don't want you to be proud. I've given you so much understanding. I've given you so much ability. I'm going to let you do things that other people can't do. You're going to go into a town, and in a few weeks, we've been studying on Wednesday night, the, the, the missionary progress of Paul in the different cities. You can go into town, and in a few weeks, you can begin to see hundreds of people come to Christ. I don't know about you, but... If I saw 100 people come to Christ this week, I'd get a little proud. I'd put, a take, I'd put an ad in the paper, get on the radio. Hey, you folks got to come here, Mel Mott, because he's something. They got 100 people. It's easy to get puffed up. So God says, look, because I have given you special gifts and abilities, I'm also going to give you a thorn in the flesh. Well, that wasn't a big deal. Oh, it was a big deal. I don't know what it was. It doesn't matter what it was. But here's the thing about it. If you go back there and look, here's what he says. For this, for this thing, whatever it was, maybe it was his eyes, maybe he had some other disorder, but whatever it was, it was bad. It was a problem. It was a hindrance to him in a physical sense. For this, I besought the Lord three times that he might take it away. God, I don't like this. I don't like the fence. Little kid says, we, we, we want to play over there. Isn't it interesting? They got a big old yard, but they got a fence, and where do they want to play? Over on the other side. Sounds like Christians. Paul says, I want you to take it away, Lord. And God says, look, here's the answer. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. It's preventative. God wasn't punishing Paul. He was saving him. He was saving him from getting into something that he shouldn't be in. He was saving him from getting all built up in himself. It wasn't he wasn't a sinner. He was, or wasn't doing bad things. He was doing good things. But God says, in order to protect you, I'm going to build this fence, and that fence is going to be a thorn in the flesh. And Paul said, take it away. And he says, no, but I'll give you the grace to turn that thing into something great and powerful and special and blessed in your life. Guess what? He does the same thing for us if we'll let it. Paul says, okay, all right. If that's what you want, verse 10, therefore I take pleasure 
in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I, what? Strong. This is the exchange life. We exchange our weakness for his strength. But if we focus on the thing, if we focus on the circumstance, if we focus on the issue, if we focus on the pain, if we focus on the problem, if we focus on, on the woodshed, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss it. But Paul says, I learned that God's prevention is the best thing in the world for me. And in fact, I have learned to look at everything that others would consider negative in my life as an opportunity to be more for God. Maybe that's what God's trying to do in your life this morning. I just want to prevent you from being something and in something that you shouldn't be. Back in Hebrews, there's a third thing that God's doing and I believe trying to do in our life today through our discipline and his discipline, and that is education. Sometimes he disciplines us to correct us because we've gotten away from the Lord. We're not following him the way we should. We're disobeying his way and his will. Sometimes it's to prevent us from getting into problems. And then sometimes it's just the only way he can teach us. You say, well, I tell you what, preacher, I like it better when everything is going great. I think I could learn in prosperity better than adversity. Well, you ask some folks and look at folks who are in prosperity and see how well they're doing. Not how well they're doing in finances, not how well they're doing in business, not how well they're doing in how many cars they have in the garage or what kind of house they live in or how big a motorhome they drive or, or, or what kind of uh, vacations they take. But look at their heart. Look at their spiritual walk. Find out how many times they're faithful to church on Sunday. Find out how much they serve. Find out what they're doing with that prosperity that God has blessed them with. I'm going to tell you something, folks. Prosperity is one of the curses on our world for Christianity because we trust our money and we trust our stuff more than we trust our God. So what does God say? He said, there's some ways, some things I can only teach you by putting some discipline on you. Let me give you an example. How about Job? The Bible says about Job that he was a righteous man. He was upright. He eschewed evil. He hated evil. He was probably one of the most godly men of his day. So whatever God did, he didn't do it to punish him. And he didn't do it to protect him. I'm going to tell you why he did it so that Job might learn some things that he could never learn any other way. Job was still a godly man. He still hated evil. He still tried to follow God. But Job had come to a place in his life where he had kind of stopped, where you and I get to a place. We get in a comfortable place. We come up to that level, and we're about where everybody else is. Now, we don't want to get too much higher than that because folks will start looking at us and calling us names like Holy Joe or something like that. So, so we just find that, and we just sink right there, and we just kind of find that spot. And we're real comfortable, real comfortable. We know enough about God and about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit and about the Bible, you know, to make our way along but we haven't learned anything new about God in a long time. We come to church, and this book is opened up, and we come to Bible study, and we get into that book, and all kind of great things are, are shared with us, and, and we go home, and we can't remember a tenth of what we heard because we've come to that place where we're just comfortable there. We're not growing. We're just sitting there. I call it sitting and soaking and souring. So God says, okay, I got some more for you. I want to do more with you. I want you to understand more about who I am. So that's what he did for Job. And Job had no idea. He said, 
The devil come up there and said, what about old Job? And God says, okay, you can do this. And he goes down and he touches him. And, and he said, uh, well, if you just let me do this, I'll, he'll curse you. And he said, okay, you can go this far and that's all you can go. And he lost everything he had. He lost his kids. He lost his possessions. He lost his fam or family, everybody but his wife. He lost his health. But it says, but in all that, Job sinned not with his mouth. Job acknowledged God, but he never accepted what God was doing. He, he, he just went through this whole thing with his friends, and I use that term loosely, with his friends and their counsel, and, and, and he just never could get it. He just couldn't figure it out. He, he didn't blame God in a sense, but, but he just he struggled all the way through the book. But if you'll go with me to Job, the book of Job, and chapter 43, or 42. I want you to look at a, a passage here that I think is probably the most, in my opinion, the, one of the most significant parts of the whole book of Job. Two long conversations Job and God have together. And Job's accusing. God, what did I do for this? I didn't deserve this. You know, God, I know my heart. I'm innocent. There's no sin in my life. Uh, and God, and Job's just kind of pro probing here, prodding and probing. And, and, and God comes at him again, and he, and he says, Job, wait a minute. Now, now, where were you when I hung the stars in place? Tell me how I set the boundary to the oceans, Job. Do you know that? And, and he begins to take all these things. And, and who, who decided where the mountains would be and, and the river? Job, do you know anything about that? And he does this two different times. And finally, Job wakes up. And I want you to notice what it says here in Job 42. And verse uh, number three. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not. Things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee and I will speak. I will demand of thee and declare thou unto me. I have, listen, here it is. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. But now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. I'm going to tell you something, folks. After that experience, listen, after that experience, Job knew God like he had never known God before. God took him to a whole new dimension of relationship. You see, God doesn't want to save us. He doesn't want just to the fact that you know for sure that you're on the way to heaven. God wants to be in a relationship with you. He wants to be your heavenly father. He wants, and you're his children. And just like you want to have a relationship with your children, your natural children, God wants to have a relationship with your, his spiritual children. And he wants them to grow and develop and mature and get looked more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. And sometimes we just find that happy place and that comfortable place and we just sit on cruise control. And God says, okay, the only way I can get you to learn, the only way I can get your attention, the only way I can get you to listen is to take you to the woodshed. And unfortunately, that even that doesn't always work. Why doesn't it work? Well, let's go back to Hebrews and I'll show you. Verse 5, it doesn't work because of two options. Verse 5 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Why do we miss the lesson? Why is it that we, we miss the point? Why is it that we're too much like the guy when the preacher did everything but call his name and he says, Boy, boy you sure got him today. Why can't we see it? with two reasons. Number one is that we despise the chastening of the Lord. We focus so much on the experience that we miss the lesson. How do I know that I'm focusing on the experience and missing the lesson? Two things. We complain, complain, we whine, 
and we whine and we whine until God says, okay, I can't stand it anymore. Call the ambulance and get these people out of here. And we do it. We're so focused on the experience, on the circumstances, on the situation that we miss the lesson. We miss the purpose of it. If we're not whining, we're questioning. Why, 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 why? I hear this all the time. Don't worry about the why. Respond to the circumstance. Look for God. Listen to what he's trying to tell you. God has something in this. And by doing that, we take lightly, he says, the chastening of the Lord. We despise it, and we miss the blessing. We miss the purpose. The other thing is, he says, don't faint. We give up. Well, if this is the way God's going to treat me, I'm done. I'm walking away. If he's going to make me this way, I thought God had a just, you know, wonderful plan for my life. He does, folks. He has a wonderful plan. And I'm going to tell you this. The best plan in all the world is God's plan. I don't care what the world does for you. I don't care what your intelligence does for you. I don't care what your family does for you. God's plan is always the best plan. Now, it may not be the easiest plan, and it may cause you to have to make some hard choices. But he says, if you faint, if you just give up, if you just quit. I, in my office when I took over last year, um, they had all of the directories that had been pictured, directories that had been taken uh, since New Hope was founded. And, and I, I started going through those directories, and I said, where are these people? Where are they? Some of them are other churches, and that's fine. We can't have them all. We'd like to, but we can't. Some of them aren't going anywhere. They give up. They've given up. They're just sitting home, bitter, unhappy, blaming God. Well, that's not fair, preacher. It's not fair. Listen, life isn't fair. Write it down and put it in your Bible. Nobody everywhere. There's nowhere in the scripture that says life's going to be fair. God does not base his, his actions on fairness. He bases his actions on wisdom and righteousness. God always does what is right by you and for me. So don't miss it, he says. What else does he say here? Look at going into the next verse. He said, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son Every son. So the good news is today, if you're getting it, that means you belong to him. We used to have some neighbor kids. Kid lived across the street when I was in first grade. Rottenest little kid named Bobby Brown. Oh, my. Oh. That kid would beat me up every chance he got. My dad got tired of me getting beat up, and he said, if you come home beat up one more time, he said, I'm going to whoop you too. I was way more afraid of dad than I was Bobby Brown. So the next time I'm on the way home from school, and here comes Bobby Brown around the corner, I just tore into him, and I, he didn't bother me anymore after that. <laughs> but guess what? If I'd have got whooped by Bobby Brown again, my daddy wouldn't have whooped him because he wasn't his kid. If you're getting whooped this morning, I got news for you. And it's good news. You belong to the king. He doesn't whoop the neighbor's kids. He hits whoops his own. And he does so with a love and a purpose. He says, because God loves you. I know that's hard to understand sometimes. How can God love me and do the cut level? What's happening in my life? I can't explain all that, but I know this. If you belong to him, he's going to discipline you. And if he disciplines you, it's because he loves you. And if he loves you, he's doing something for your good and not for your bad. You can take that home with you today. I promise you that. Now, here's the dangerous part. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons, for a son is he whom the chasteneth not. But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards, illegitimate, not sons. 
I've had people say to me, I don't understand what you're talking about, preacher, when you talk about chastening and discipline and, and difficulties and trials. I don't understand that. I, I, I don't have any problems whatsoever. That is not good news. Because if you profess to know Jesus Christ this morning as your personal Savior and Lord, I got news for you. He's going to be on your case. Not to be mean, but because he loves you, because he wants more out of you, because he wants you to be something better than you are. He wants you to do more than you can do right now, and he's going to be working in your life, and that's going to mean some difficulties, some trials, some challenging situations. But if he's leaving you alone, you don't belong to him. And I'm going to tell you something, and I just say this with all love of my heart. I wonder how many that make the profession really have a possession. Because I see folks, I see folks that say they know Christ and they live for this world. They have no more time for God's book, God's house. They come when they feel like it. They serve when they want to. And if they don't want to, we were going through this week. I was, we were talking about it. We're getting ready to work on officers for the coming year. And we need some teachers. And I sat down with our new directory, and I started going through the pictures. Probably those pictures represent upwards of three or 400 people, counting babies and everything. I started making a list. I think they could do it. I think they could serve. Oh, but they're not faithful. They, they come when they feel like it. They come when there's nothing else going on, when the kids don't have a ball game, when they don't want to, you know, they come if they don't want to, when they, they didn't, they slept in on Saturday, so they don't have to sleep in on Sunday. This is serious, folks. This is serious stuff. If you're a child of God, He's going to be on your case. Doesn't mean he's going to put you in the hospital or give you some incurable disease. But if he's not working on your life, if there's not some challenges, if he's not trying to stretch your faith, if he's not trying to prune those things that are unnecessary so you can be more fruitful, John 15, if he's not doing any of that stuff, I'd be concerned. I'd get my Bible out and get on my knees and start searching my heart. Because he said, if God's not chastening you, then you don't belong to him. I'm not trying to talk anybody out of their salvation. I'm not trying to make anybody guilty or doubt that uh, if you're saved or not. I'm just telling you this morning, this is part of the program of God. This is part of God's family relationship. He's working to conform you and me to the image of his son. Well, what if I don't know why God is doing it? Just trust him. Just trust him. Here's the interesting thing. Do you know that Job never found out why? Never. God never took him aside after all he went to and sat him down one day and said, Job, now you've been a good guy and you've learned more about me than anybody would ever have thought you. And you, you've, you've learned new things and you've stretched yourself and I just want you to know why I was doing this. Uh -uh. As far as we can tell, not till he stood before God one day after his death and stood before his heavenly father did he find out what was going on. He had no idea. And you may not know idea any day, but listen to this. It's not about what's happening to you. It's how you respond to what's happening to you that makes the difference. We may not always know the reason, but we can always be assured that it will be for our good and his glory. Romans 8, 28, the verse that we quote so often, for we know, remember that part, for we know that all things, not all things are good, but all things work together for our good to them who are the called of God and the, or, uh, who love God and are called according to, uh, according to his purposes. When God works, folks, God's just trying to make you better. And when he makes us better, guess who gets the glory? He does. I have two questions this morning. 
If you've been in the woodshed lately, maybe God's clarified some things for you as to why. And maybe you need to take some action today. You don't have to do anything with me. I didn't take you there, but God did. If, he, if he's opened your eyes to some things this morning, this is the place you need to come do business. If you're here this morning and you're not sure that you're on your way to heaven when you die, I don't care if you walk the aisle. I don't care if you said a prayer. I don't care if your name's on the rolls of New Hope Bible Baptist Church. If you're not sure that the moment you stop breathing, you're going to be with your, with your Father in heaven, if you don't know that, today's the day you need to make that right. If you've been thinking about it, you've been praying about it, God's been speaking to you, today is the day you need to nail that thing down and make sure. And it's just a step of faith to receive with the hand of faith the gift of eternal life and commit your life to Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the woodshed. I thank you that you love me too much to lead me the way I am. I thank you that you protect me. I thank you, Lord, that you care enough to teach me. Show me some things about you that I didn't know before. And the lessons are hard, but they're valuable. They're precious. They're important. God, help today. May your spirit take your word and search hearts. And may your people be responsive to what you're telling them, the conviction that you're bringing to them. May they say, Lord, here I come. If there's somebody here today, Lord, that's not saved, maybe they thought they were. Make sure that they know that today before they leave, Lord. Help them to give their life to Christ. Take the step of faith. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing or have the invitation. You need to come. I'll be right here. I'll pray with you. We'll get somebody to pray with you. But you come, would you?
master.